Hey everyone, welcome back to JM Lectures. This is the uh, sixth unit in the series and it's on rotational motion. Um, let's look at the question. So the tenth question says, a thin rod when rotated about an axis at the end of the rod has a moment of inertia of one-third ml square. The rod has a mass of 1.5 kg and the length of one meter. If the rod initially at rest, gains a rotational kinetic energy of 1,000 joules. At what speed does it rotate? Okay, so we're given a whole bunch of information here. Let's start with that and write what we are given. This is the 10th question, and let's just write down what we are given. The first thing we're given is actually a formula. Lucky for us, we're given the formula for moment of inertia, which is 1 third ml squared of a rod where the axis of rotation is at the end. Next, we're also given the mass, so we have half the part for finding the moment of inertia, the mass of 1.5 kg. And we're in fact also given the length, which is one meter. So apparently we can find moment of inertia, but of course that isn't the question. Um, we're also given kinetic energy. The kinetic energy or the rotational kinetic energy, which I'll represent with an R, is given to be 5,000 joules. And we're also, I'm sorry, it's given to be 1,000 joules, my bad. So it's given to be 1,000 joules. Uh, we're also given that the initial speed, right? So the initial rotational speed, which we represent by this, the initial speed is zero rad per second, which is the unit of angular velocity, okay? And we're asked, so what we're required to find is the final angular velocity. Okay, so we actually have everything we need to find this final angular velocity. But let's first talk about what we're talking about. We're talking about angular velocity, we're talking about rotational kinetic energy, and we're talking about moment of inertia. So moment of inertia is a term used to describe mass, okay? It's, it's a term used to describe mass of a rotating body, okay? Moment of inertia is the rotational form of mass. All it means is that whenever you have a body, okay, so let's say that we have this body here, it's just a flat circle. This body has mass, right? All moment of inertia is saying is that when an object is rotating about an axis, so let's consider this axis here. Let me just poke a hole in the center, or what I think is the center. So let's say this body is rotating about this axis, right? All moment of inertia is, is how is the mass distributed in relation to this axis? What is the mass of this particle here in relation to the axis, and this particle here in relation to the axis, or the summation of all the particles in relation to the axis. And the thing is, there is a general formula. The general formula for moment of inertia is, uh, generally, moment of inertia is equal to the summation of all the masses multiplied by the radius from the axis squared. Okay, so that's the general formula. But think about it, depending on the mass of the object, depending on the size and the shape of the object, and depending on which axis I choose, the moment of inertia is different, okay? So in this case, we're talking about a rod, okay? So a rod, let's draw it something like this. We have a rod like so. And the moment of inertia, or the axis, the moment of inertia is calculated because of the axis which is at the tip, okay? So this rod is basically rotating at the tip um, where the axis of rotation is at the tip of the rod. I didn't really explain that properly, but anyway, depending on where the axis is, you get different formulas for moment of inertia. So you get different formulas of moment of inertia depending on if it's a, a disc, something like this, or maybe a, what you call a flywheel, something like this, for example. So depending on the shape, the size, and the mass of the body, you get different moments of inertia. But we have the formula right here. We have the formula for moment of inertia given in our question, okay? All right, so I got a little ahead of myself because we're not actually looking for a moment of inertia. We're looking for angular velocity, okay? So angular velocity, luckily enough, it's very similar to linear velocity. And in fact, let me erase this right here so we can see how linear and rotational quantities are related, okay? It's not just helpful for this question, but for future questions also. So recap, let us compare linear quantities with rotational quantities rotational, oh, not much room, rotational quantity. So let's compare the two. Let's start with the basic. Let's start with distance or displacement in a linear quantity. Well, in a linear quantity, if you have distance, in a rotational quantity, you have something called 
the angle, all right, so, or theta that you sometimes use. If you have velocity in the linear quantity, it's simply angular velocity in the rotational quantity. If you have something like mass in the linear quantity, it's simply moment of inertia in the rotational quantity. Something like, uh, what else? Acceleration in the linear quantity, it is, um, it is angular acceleration in the rotational quantity. Something like force, it is torque in the rotational quantity. I'm not saying that these two qualities are equal. I'm saying that they're related. So if you have a formula, if you know the formula in linear concepts, it's very easy to convert it in rotational concepts. I'll explain what I mean in just a bit when we try to answer this question. So, I'm sorry, when we try to answer this question. So let us find the solution. I hope I have enough room to do this. So let's say that we can't remember the formula for rotational kinetic energy. If we know the formula for linear kinetic kinetic energy, okay, since we've been learning this since since we've been learning this since seventh grade, this might come easier to us. The formula is simply half mv squared, okay? For rotational kinetic energy, all you have to do is just use this conversion, okay? So for mass, we said for mass, we use moment of inertia, so it's moment of inertia. For velocity, we use angular velocity, so that'd just be omega squared. And that's as simple as that to finding the definition of kinetic rotational energy, okay? It, both, both concepts are the same. This is just the kinetic energy or the energy that a moving body has when it's moving in a straight line. And kinetic energy rotational, rotational, and the rotational kinetic energy is simply the kinetic energy that a body has when moving in a rotation, okay, or in a circular motion. Anyway, it's just as simple as plugging in numbers after this. But first, let's kind of rewrite the formulas so we have moment of inertia using this formula here. So again, kinetic energy rotational is equal to half moment of inertia, which we know, or which we're given as one third ml squared times omega squared. And we're looking for that omega final. We don't have to consider omega initial because it's in fact zero, okay? So after that, it's just plugging in numbers. Let me use a different color here so we can see that kinetic energy rotational is given as 1000 joules, which is equal to half of one third of the mass, which is 1.5 kgs, but I'm gonna write it as uh, three over two, so I can simplify it easier. And the uh, three over two kg, sorry, I have to consider the units. Three over two kg times the length, which is one meter, one meter squared, times, I'm just following the formula, omega squared, which is in fact what we are looking for, okay? So let's simplify all of this, and we'll get something that says 1,000 joules is equal to Cancel this out by this and all of that. Uh, one fourth kg meter squared omega squared. Okay, so again, we can divide both sides by one fourth or we can multiply this four by here to get 4,000. Uh, when we divide the joules by the kg meter squared, we're actually going to get meter squared per second squared. All right, so 4,000 meters squared per second squared is equal to omega squared. We can square root both sides. So when we simplify this, we're gonna use math concepts to simplify this root. We'll get something, I have not a lot of room, so I'm just gonna give you the final answer, that omega would be equal to 20 root 10, and the unit you get would be rad per second, okay? So um, this would be the final answer to finding the final omega, okay? It was as simple as knowing the linear kinetic energy. If you know the linear, it's so much easier to find the rotational. And it's not just for kinetic energy, it's for any concept. If you know the linear form, it's much easier to find the kinetic, to find the rotational form. Anyway, if we see our choices here, we see that it is choice B, 20 root 10 rad per second. And that's it. All right, so our second question on rotational motion is question 11. And it says that if in a given rotational system of a body, the angular momentum is increased with time, which one of the following statements is not correct? Okay, so the question is asking us about a change in angular momentum, right? An increase in angular momentum with time. That is actually the definition of angular impulse, okay? So impulse is just saying how does, or angular impulse is just saying how does the momentum change with time? Specifically, this change in momentum is an increase, so we have this change in angular momentum, which we represent with an L, okay? So we have an increase in this angular momentum as time goes by. 
It's asking us which of the following statements is not correct. Before we see the choices again, let's look at what might affect angular momentum. Well, there are a lot of formulas for angular momentum. One such formula being the change in angular momentum is equal to the torque imparted on the body as time changes, right? If a torque is if a torque is applied on a body, there will be an increase in angular momentum. Another formula of angular momentum is the moment of inertia multiplied by the change in angular velocity. Another formula for angular momentum is the mass times the radius squared times the change in angular momentum. And all I'm doing is just replacing moment of inertia with the formula mr squared. Okay, so all of these things cause an effect, okay? So all of these things may have an effect in the angular momentum, which is what the question is asking. Actually, the question is asking us which of them doesn't have an effect. So let's just look at our choices here. The first choice says that the radius of rotation may increase. So let's look at our formula here and let's see where do we have radius of rotation? Well, we have radius of rotation right here, right? So if the radius of rotation increases, yeah, that will lead to an increase in the angular momentum. So that would be correct. If the radius increases, then the moment of inertia or the change in moment, oh, I'm sorry, the change in angular momentum would also increase, okay? Let's look at the second question. The moment of inertia may increase. Yeah, well, we have that right here. If the moment of inertia increases, if the moment of inertia increases, then also the change in angular momentum would increase, which makes sense. The third choice, C, says there is a torque exerted on the system. So it's not talking about an increase or decrease in torque. It is talking about the presence of a torque. Well, yes, that is also true. If there is no torque, there cannot be a change in angular momentum. In order there, for there to be a change, be it a decrease or an increase, there must be a torque supplied. So if there is a torque, this is the special case, because if there is a torque present, right, if there is a torque, that just means, it equivocates, it, that just means that there is also a change in angular momentum. That's a literal definition of what torque, that's a literal definition of what effect torque might have on angular momentum. If you look at choice D, it says there's no torque exerted on the system, which is the exact opposite of choice C, so that must be the answer. That must be the answer that says what's not correct about the change in angular momentum, okay? so. Let's say that you have no idea about the change in angular momentum and angular impulse and all that. These choices, this might be one of the cases where looking at the choices will help you with the answer, okay? So you see that choice C and choice D are exact opposites of each other. When that is the case, one of the two is the correct answer, okay? Most of the time, this happens a lot. Choice C says that there is a torque and choice D said there is no torque, okay? One of the two must be the correct answers, okay? But maybe, by some chance, if you know that angular momentum is torque times time, there obviously has to be a torque for there to be an angular momentum. That would cancel out choice C as being incorrect, and choice D could be the only correct answer. The only incorrect answer, sorry. As in, in this case, it's not correct, but that makes it the answer of the choice, if that makes any sense. Anyway, that's it. We just use our formulas and some knowledge that we have on momentum and rotational motion in order to answer this question.